Hey guys, Downey here. I've been wanting to replay a Pokemon game for a good time now, so I've decided to boot up, replay, and then review White 2, what I consider to be the last actually great game in a series I love, and by far one of my favourite of all time games. But I won't just be playing it normally, oh no, there's a twist. I'll be running Dranu's Vault White 2 Challenge Mod, adding every single Pokemon to be caught into the game, a lot of move rebalancing, and a ton of other changes. And for another twist, this run will be a complete Nuzlocke. A challenge I've never given a try, but for this video at least, I'll put it to the test. For those who don't know what a Nuzlocke is, if a Pokemon faints, it's dead permanently, and you can only catch one Pokemon per route, the first one you find. It's a challenge I've always wanted to do, and I tried it once a few years ago, but I gave up halfway through. I've also been warned that the Nuzlocke of a Gen 5 game is very hard, even for an experienced runner. But no quitting this time though. Wish me luck guys, this could be rough. Also, a couple little things before the review begins. I'll be scripting this video while I play, so please don't expect me to break down every section of the game individually like in my other videos. I'll mention plot, gameplay, balance, music, graphics, issue and praise while delivering a kind of diary of my first ever Nuzlocke run. Also, one more thing is that my emulator had some issues crashing at points while playing this, so sometimes my recordings might show me making save states so I don't lose progress. Enjoy, guys. We start off our adventure in our spacious city. This area also has one of the best songs in the game, by the way. Our mother getting a phone call from the professor, an old friend, and wanting us to go on an adventure. We meet up with her assistant, Bianca, best girl, by the way, and I choose my starter. I've replayed Gen 5 a lot, so I went with my least picked one, Snivy. I call him Cabbage and fought the last good rival the series has had to this point, Hugh. More on him in a second, anyway, this battle is where I discovered Cabbage's ability, contrary. Now, this is spicy. It means that any stat changes to him are opposite, so I could abuse this later on. I defeat Hugh and go north to Route 1, then the ranch, and I catch three more Pokemon along the way. Beard the Pidgey, I don't know, I just thought of that. Wojak the Mankey, and Robert the Mareep, and I grinded until they were all level 10. After this, we sort out the farmer's trouble on the ranch by finding a missing dog, and then the former champion Alder teaches us a bit about battling. After this, he tells us to go back to Aspertia City where we started because the first gym is there. But on the way, we meet the medal guy, the game's achievement system, and the only time I can really remember something like this being done in a Pokemon game. And for an achievement system, it's really solid. Collectible medals for doing certain things. But there's one little issue I have with it. I'd prefer to get items alongside these medals to incentivize them rather than just a piece of metal and, you know, a little certificate saying that you did it. Because some of these are really tough, like beating the league with only a certain type of Pokemon. Some other things I want to praise about this game so far. It looks gorgeous, being the game's final DS entries and the series' fifth games on it, they've really gotten down how they want it to look and sound on the console. I love the small details too, the animated sprites for trainer encounters and all Pokemon having moving animations. Hell, if, even little things like the sleeping Pokemon sprites or the fact that while you're moving along a route there's an extra drum beat to really add to a sense of adventure. It all really builds up gradually in what I would consider to be the perfect presentation for a Pokemon game. Before I get any further into this, let me just bring up Hugh and why I think he's one of the series' strongest rivals, alongside likes of Silver. First off, his motivations. He wants strength above all else because he has a vendetta against Team Plasma for stealing his sister's purloin a few years ago, as it was not only their pet but a gift from their late grandfather. This is perfect. Simple and easy to understand but it gives him a clear and concise motivation and character arc. From a simple story we can see that he's motivated, he has a clear goal in mind but he has flaws in how much hate he has for Team Plasma and how he really doesn't see anything beyond them. This is what a rival needs to be. Infinitely better than what we've had for almost a decade since then of your best friends on this journey with you and they battle you because it's fun or whatever. And don't even get me started on Barry and the Gen 3 rivals. Wally, some kid with asthma, somehow manages to do a better job than any of these clowns. The first Gen 5 games had, I would say, my favourite friendly arrivals in the series, and now White 2 has the tied best rival in the series with Silver. Just great. Anyway, I just want to rant about why I love Gen 5 for a bit. Back to the review. I beat two kid trainers at the first gym, get some grinding done, now most of my team's level 14. A fair enough level to beat the first gym leader without worry. And he turns out to be Sharon, a rival from the first games. He's also a prominent character in this game later on, which I feel works great for the adventure. It's a sequel, so the position he's in now makes sense, and also it's just cool to see him. 
His battle wasn't that tough though. He specialised in the normal types where I just let Wojak tear through everything without much hassle, and quickly most of his team goes down. A small detail with the gym battles in this generation is that once they're pushed back to the last and typically strongest Pokemon, the music changes from this intense struggle which is already fantastic, into a triumphant remix of the Pokemon series' main theme. It gets you so pumped when fighting a tough battle. After this we head over to Verbank, but along the way I have a close call with a Dunsparce and almost kill Beard. We get to Verbank which has also another great song, and I head south for a new Pokemon. There are two places where I can get something, my first encounter is an Ekans I call Michael, and Growlithe which I call Carlton. Now I have a full team of six so I have to get some more grinding done against the rest of the trainers in the complex. Cabbage, Beard, Robert all evolved and by the end of it everything on my team was between levels 18 to 21. Now I think I'm ready to take on Roxy. Something I really noticed during this gym is that every trainer encounter has its own unique music which I think is really cool. I love the aesthetic of the gym too, it's an underground club and there's a big neon coughing in the background, my favourite Pokemon so of course I gotta like it. I took out her bandmates and then the big battle against Roxy began. I remembered this being a very tough fight so I might have over prepared. I started out with Robert who critted down the Trubbish setting up spikes. He then went on to use his boosted hits to beat Coughing too. Then Whirlipede came out so I switched to Michael. He's a poison type so he deleted a toxic spikes upon entry, got an intimidation off and I landed a glare paralyzing it. Then I make a quick switch into Beard who takes out Whirlipede and then Crogunk. This was a tense battle and at any moment things could have gone very bad. A Whirlipede sweep was very possible. Once this is done I help out Roxy's dad who's having a midlife crisis about wanting to be an actor but he's just shit at it, and then we have our first encounter with Neo Team Plasma. Both of these issues converge in us convincing Roxy's dad to go back to being a sailor and get us to Castellia City. Before we go, however, I explore Castellia City and find a trainer who gives us a second starter, a Trico which I call Trunks after my real life gecko. Upon arriving to the largest city in the game and the largest city in the series up until then, instead of doing any of the fun activities offered up and training my Pokemon, I immediately chased the plot and search for Team Plasma in the sewers with you, until I realised just how underleveled I was, so I went back up to grind. Also down there, my first wild encounter was a Zubat and a Coughing. Hugh killed the Zubat, so I kept the Coughing. I went around and explored Castellia City a bit, got two more starters, a Toadstall I called Teeth and a Chimchar I called Monkey, very original I know. Got a second EXP share, and now with my much stronger party, I went back to the sewers. Beat up Team Plasma and I met Colrus for the first time, an important character I'll bring up later. I now had three more wild Pokemon to catch, one in Relic Passage, a cave accessible by Sewer, I went there and caught a Rhyhorn I called Raja, I then went up to the Hidden Garden and caught a Bell Sprout I called Carrot, and finally I realised that Victory Garden was open, and by my own rule set, Victini was fair game. I caught it, nicknamed it Slug, put it in the PC as a just in case measure if Berg was too much, and then I just grinded out Relic Passage for a bit to get some more levels. I then realised that Route 4 was also open to get some more grinding done, so I went up there and I found a new Pokemon too, an LGM I called Sean. Now on to Berg's gym. The puzzle here is simple, just get up through the cocoons and fight the occasional trainer. Really nothing too hard. But I loved the aesthetic and sound that Game Freak gave this little area. Pokemon Black and White 2 have a unique theme for every gym, and that's just one of the small details I love so much about this game. Now on to the battle with Berg. I'm relying heavily on Carlton, so I'm hoping things don't go awfully. He leads with a Vespicum, which takes some good hits but goes down without a hassle. Then into a Masquerain, which he spammed with a double team but again was no trouble, aside from it harming Robert a bit. Then into the real threat, Levani. Beard managed to kill it, no hassle, and I let out a sigh of relief. What could happen from here? Tragedy struck in the form of Scyther. One shot Beard with a flying gem wing attack. I had to move around Carlton and Michael enough to get enough intimidation scum to lower its attack. Plus Michael got a glare off. Sadly Wojak fell in order to get Carlton on the field, so I finished up Scyther and his final Pokemon Paris. I've now replaced Beard and Wojak with Teeth and Sean. But wow, I wasn't expecting two casualties from this gym. Route 4 doesn't start off any easier either, the chorus fight, which has an absolutely killer song. I was honestly more worried about this than Berg. We're in a permanent sandstorm here and his team is tough, mostly steel and electric types, 
Corvus's goal as a character is he wants to find out what truly makes a strong Pokemon and believe it's his job to make a Pokemon as strong as possible, and he takes this to heart with his battle. His team has three main terrifying members, a Rotom fan that's very fast and does huge hits, a monstrous Matang that I can't scum with Intimidate because it has clear body, and finally a Porygon 2 with monstrous special attack and even sillier defences, which I believe is from an Eviolite. This one was tough. Thankfully we had no casualties, but Sean and Robert came very close to dying. It was a tough battle that had to go about slowly, maneuvering Pokemon around tactically, healing Pokemon that can take some hits, in order to get Cabbage on the field so he can carry with his Dragon Rage. After this, it's on to the rest of Route 4. After cleaning up Route 4 without much issue, I catch some more Pokemon. I'm using the two desert resort areas as two separate zones. In one of them, I catch a Sandile called Sheila, and in the area proper, I catch a Trap Inch I call Cell. I clean up this area too, get a Firestone so I can evolve Carlton. And finally, I get inside the Relic Castle and caught a Golek that I called Gimlaw. I then head up to Nimbasa, Route 5, Route 16, and other areas in order to train up some more Pokemon for the biggest threat so far, Elisa. On Route 5, I catch Horsey the Ponyta, something I really don't need at the moment, especially with Carlton being a big dog now. While on Route 16, I get a Ponyard called Fork, and just head as Lost Lone Forest, where I catch Bink the Mirkrow. During this, I get a load of training done, so the Cabbage, Sheila, Sean, Cell, Teeth, and Robert are all evolved. Now I do some sports events for XP, do the old gym, and now on to Elisa's gym. A small detail I love in this place is how the music grows more intense the more trainers you've beaten. No real issues so far, and now it's time for the Elisa fight. Something that I'm honestly a bit scared for. I open with Carlton, because I'm anticipating some grand counter off the bat, and she starts with Emolga. Hit to 1 HP and it vault switches into Lantern. Cabbage deals with it quickly. Intimidate's good against physical attackers, right? Plus Dig should make this no problem. Wrong. This thing knows Psychic and it's running Life Orb. Michael takes it down to low HP but I know he can't take another Psychic. So I make a quick swap back to Cabbage who can tank the hit and the Life Orb damage kills the Electabuzz. Then Zeb Striker comes out, so I let Sheila try and handle it. But I can't land a dig because it just uses Bounce. I heal up Carlton before the second Bounce comes down to finish Sheila and he misses. The perfect luck comes for me and now it's a simple game. I swap in Carlton while she Volt Switch in Ampharos and with a dig and fire fang it's dead. Then Zeb Striker again who does another Volt Switch into Emolga and now I'm static paralyzed. Damn. I swap to Gimlor against the Zeb Striker who goes for an overheat. I'm scared at this point because I know Gimlor doesn't have the strongest special defense. It misses and I get a magnitude 10 that one shots it. This was the perfect battle for me, and there were so many factors that could have gone wrong. Lantern could have used Ice Beam and killed Cabbage, Amphros could have no Power Gem and taken out Carlton, but I managed to pull it off. Now on to Driftvale. Also, for the time being I'm replacing Robert with Gimlaw, as I won't need Robert in the next gym and I want to keep him safe. Also, Gimlaw was just the MVP there, absolutely. On the bridge there I catch a Wingle I call Seabeard, and on Route 6 I catch a Dealing called Homer. I then head to charge them cave to get some more training done and I get a Magnemite I call Nut. In Driftvale you also meet Rude, a former Team Plasma higher up who quit after the previous game and is now leading a group of ex-Team Plasma members who genuinely just wanted to follow in in making the world a better place and they're now trying to make up for what they've done. It's at this time too you get to see really how much of a blind rage you has for anyone in Team Plasma. Again, for a kid's game, it's interesting to see a dynamic where the good guys are actually kind people and the good person is filled with hatred. Time to train up those Pokemon so we have a better odds against Clay. Another very tough gym. Also, this is the game's first actual gym puzzle, all about exploring an underground mine in the dark to find Clay. The issue here is that my emulator breaks the dark effect so it's not hard at all. Also, I feel I was a bit overleveled by this one. When I was told the Pokemon I could use were up to level 50, I went a bit nuts and they were about level 45 to 47. First off was a Crocodile, which I put to barely any HP left and it swapped into Seismitoad. I get in Sean and set up some Calm Mines, and then get some Sweeping done. Kill Seismitoad. And then Crocodile comes back in. I forgot. I swap into Homer who finishes it up, then Nido King is called out, so I get Sean back in to kill it and he tanks a crit earthquake on 6 HP. On the same turn, the sandstorm ends. I was terrified. I swap into Gimlaw, who gets a magnitude 9 and takes out Nidoking, while Homer takes out his final two Pokemon, Claydol and Excadrill. This one wasn't as intense as Lisa, but wow, that Sean save was something. 
If my team wasn't built around countering his, I'm not sure this would have gone so well. I now head out to this side of the Relic Passage, and I thought that how different it was, I could catch a different Pokemon. So I get Concrete the Baldor, as well as now there's a new layer of Relic Castle, so I get I the Anorinth. I then do the PWT battles that aren't tough at all. Then Team Plasma ship some easy double battles, and I follow Sharon up to Route 6 to get Surf. By the way, I won't be surfing around areas I've already been to just to collect water Pokemon, because no sane man needs that many water types, especially in these games. Also, almost all surfing in this game is completely optional and not mandatory at all. Now I go into a Mr. Alshan cave to get a new Pokemon, and I find a Shellgon called Egg. Nice. Also, by there, there's a tornado you can encounter, but I've already caught something here, so I just ignore it. Now into Chargestone Cave proper, and I have one little issue with the area. The wild Pokemon and trainers are just too low level, like we just had a gym with level 40 Pokemon. Why are all the trainers here using like level 33 Pokemon which don't give anywhere near enough XP? I know this is probably more of an issue for me because I'm over leveled, but still. Now onto Route 7 where I catch Rat the Watchhog, and while we're here, just another little gameplay observation is I love how easy it is to grind in this game. Nearly every area you'll want to grind in has someone or something you can use there as a Pokemon Center to fully heal everything instantly. It's just another reason why this game is so fun. Then I go up Celestial Tower which is basically a graveyard for Pokemon and I might get something exciting here. I catch a Litwick called Lumpy and I just quickly scale the whole thing for some extra XP. Nothing really of note happened on the ascent. Now back to Skylar for another gym. The puzzle this time is about making your way quickly between harsh gusts of wind, the gym itself being an airport. However, the trainers here were really tough for some reason, so I went back, got some more training done, and now it's time for Skylar proper. Now let me be completely honest about this. Skylar was an absolute joke of a gym. Egg seriously swept through almost everything with Shadow Clone Rock Slide, and due to his Moxie ability, he would keep on gaining more and more power. He killed Archeops, got an attack boost, two-hitted Spawner, hit Ace in the hole, and swept everything until Skarmory, which Nut killed with ease. I genuinely felt a bit bad for doing this. Following this, Professor Juniper suggests Skylar to fly us to Lentimus Town so we can work our way up to Opelucid to see what Team Plasma's up to. The reason she suggests this in particular is because Drayden, the Dragon-type gym leader there, may know more. Also, Bianca joins us for this point in the game because she has some research to carry out nearby Lentimus. On the way there, I catch Keith the Torkoal and Rick the Drowsy within the haunted house and nail the Slugma inside the mountain. Once I get deeper in, Bianca accompanies me so every time I beat a trainer I keep getting healed. Really nothing happens at this point in the game for me outside just getting some more experience and Cabbage almost dying during a double battle but nothing really that interesting. While I was here I was challenged by Hugh and an issue I found in the game so far is that you don't fight him nearly enough. Reed the last time we fought was at the PWT which was a joke and before then I can't remember. His fight was challenging enough but nothing special or worth commenting on. I head south and catch a Drifblim I call Buffalo, and head north to Opelucid. This is a very long stretch of routes without much going on, so I'll just be brief here, listing any catches or deaths along the way. On Route 13, I catch a Manetric I forget to nickname. I've already caught enough electric types for any sane man to use at this point. I then head up to Lacunoso, which also has a banger theme, and I'm told about the giant chasm and a powerful ice-type Pokemon that could rival Reshiram in strength. There's also a Team Plasma fight here with Hugh that I thought wouldn't be an issue, but I make one fatal mistake. I trust the AI partner. Instead of switching out Cabbage in the face of a wall rain, I attack and hope Hugh would finish it off. In one shot, while Hugh simply healed, Cabbage died. I've now replaced him with Carlton, but I'm devastated. And I'm gonna grind some more before we go to Opelucid and beat Drayden, without another casualty, I hope. On Route 12, I get a giraffe rig I call Cory, and at the Village Bridge, which has another banger track, which you can enhance by talking to NPCs around the bridge, I catch a Marrow called Mouse. It's just a great little area with a Japanese feel. Also, there's a lot of triple and rotation battles around this section. Triple battles are 3v3 without anything special, and rotation battles basically mean you can swap Pokemon and attack on the same turn. It's a shame that these aren't in future games, because I really like them. Then on to Route 11, I catch a Viper called Michael 2. Now finally I get to Opelucid. Meet Iris again, a character you meet in Castellia City early on. Heal and enjoy the absolute banger here. Sorry for going on about it, but this game's soundtrack, man. It never fails to blow me away on a replay with how fantastic it is. 
I go to Route 9 to get some more leveling done, and I catch a mutt called Heinz. Then, once all my Pokemon are around level 60, I get to the gym. The trainers leading up to Drayden were tough. You had to make a choice of which type of team you'd come up against. The music and aesthetic for this area are great. I chose the rotation battle and the defensive team. On to Drayden's battle now, and I did my best to make it through with only one casualty, and I'll spoil it now. Carlton didn't make it. He started the battle well, dealt with his wireless no problem, and then Flygon came out. Gimlor could stay in and tank its Draco Meteors until its special attack was in a really poor shape, once again being the surprise MVP. Then it did a Dragon Tail which forced Carlton to come back in. Carlton did his best and took out the Flygon and then Haxorus came in. So I decided to let Carlton try again after I healed him. Haxorus then hit Carlton with a critical hit Dragon Gem boosted Stab Outrage. Needless to say, he didn't make it. Sean's up next so I do some more Karmide setups and after a Psychic and a Self Damage and Confusion, it's all one. Michael deals with the Drudigan and Nut deals with the Altaria. Following this, I replace Carlton with Lumpy the Litwick I got earlier and train it until it's a chandelier, and now I head over to Drayden, who gives me a TLDR version of Gen 5's plot. During this, he also mentions Kiram, the Pokemon, before getting cut off by Team Plasma launching a full-scale invasion of Opelucid City, freezing it over and demanding the DNA splices from him. Now we have some more Team Plasma goons to deal with here, which are all very easy, and a higher-up member of Team Plasma, Zimslin, who uses an ice base team. It's quite annoying with his wall rain healing 1 8th of his HP every turn, but aside from that, nothing bad. Then after all of this, the Shadow Triad steal the splices anyway, before battling with us to get some time to get away. We get a Discord group call from Hugh and Sharon saying that they're headed north towards Humalau City. So we go back to Andela with Fly, go through the Marine Tube, a segment that I love, after how hectic and challenging the gameplay's been lately. Just a nice chill area to vibe out with is greatly appreciated. Once we arrive, we finally meet the final gym leader, Marlin, who specialises in water type Pokemon, and I head up to Route 22 and catch a pile of swine I call Tusk, because I'm not very original. One issue I find with the water type gym this late in the game is that there are so many counters to water types you can get throughout the game. By now, you just have so many options on how to deal with everything he'll probably have. So in preparation, I sub in Robert and Homer for Lumpy and Gimlaw and head to the gym. I think the look of this gym is perfect and the puzzle of using lily pads to cross water gaps is really fun. Also, the really relaxed gym music here remakes this area seem very different to every other gym in the game so far. The trainers in the gym are all fairly simple, so I go into this battle very cocky. He starts the Polito, which sets up rain while I send out Robert first, and I get it to just 1 HP. We both switch. I put Nog on the field while he puts out Caracosta, which Nut kills without issue. Then out comes Tentacruel, so after trying to get Robert in a situation to kill it, which I just can't quite pull off, I put in Sean, who does the best play in the whole run. He tanks a hit and takes it down with ease. From there, the rest of the fight is really easy, but damn, Sean, that was one save, mate. After getting the final gym badge, we're told to go and explore around some more for Team Plasma. I head up towards the giant chasm and get a gold bout. Not bad. Then Chorus bumps into us and gives us a machine to energize Pokemon, explaining we should go to Route 21 in a cave to see if we can find a use for it there. Because this is the only point in the game that requires us to travel over the water, I get out my old mate Seabeard, do some training so I'm not down a Pokemon completely, and to Route 21 we go. I get a tentacle I call Jello. Okay, I'm not gonna use him, but alright. Then it's just on to the rest of Route 21, where really nothing of note happens. Inside the cave, I find a girder I call Concrete 2, and we move on in search of Team Plasma. Deep inside the cave, I find a suspicious rock, use the chorus machine, and it's a crustal. We beat it, it moves, and now we're at the frigate again. Nice. Marlin lets us on board because he's already snuck on. He has no issue with Team Plasma personally, but he's a cool enough dude to let us sort them out if we feel like it. Once on board, we discover that we need a password and keycard to get beneath deck. Also here, we meet up with some spies which Rude from earlier placed on board, which I think is a really cool little detail. Twelve or so battles later, we have the password and keycard in hand, and we go beneath deck, discovering that the legendary Pokemon Curum is being harvested for its raw energy to power Team Plasma's ship. We have a double battle with Hugh against Zinslin, another Team Plasma goon, before the Shadow Tribe kick us off the ship while they fly away to the giant chasm. We follow them there and we meet up with Hugh to see Rude hold off the rest of Team Plasma while we board the ship again and venture deep beneath deck to put a stop to Team Plasma's plan. Also, the MIDI bass guitar in this area is just fantastic. 
There's a small puzzle segment in this area about finding four buttons to open up a new gate, and once you do, it's another fight against Zinzolin with a full team of six Pokemon. The final Zinzolin battle is an absolute joke, dealt with almost entirely by Nut and Lumpy aside from the Drifblim which Michael dealt with. Now on to the surprise reveal. Colrus is joined up with Team Plasma in order to aid his research at any cost. And I'm not sure if I said it before, but his theme fucking slaps. Gimlos starts off and deals with Behem. Now it's just to deal with the Rotom, so I swap in Sean, set up a load of card mines, and get to work sweeping away. His Rotom would come in, Volt switch out, and whatever poor sod came in would take a harsh psychic. Magnazone was a bit of a threat, but then Synchronoise kicked in and paralyzed it. Metagross came out and Meteor Mash, and I was in a panic. I'd gotten cocky, and I thought I was going to lose Sean for it. But then Sean does another fat save, let's go! And after this, it's just an easy cleanup, but thank you, Sean, you legend. Now we head deeper into the ship and finally meet with Getsus himself, proclaiming that with the empty Pokemon Kyurem, he intends to rule Unova, letting the Shadow Triad handle myself and Hugh. Hugh, however, is thrown into a panic when he's finally given back his Purloin, now a Lipad. He's finally gotten what he seeks, but the Pokemon doesn't recognize him and won't obey. After dealing with the three annoying battles, the Triad vanish and now on to Getsis, who tries to use Kyurem to murder the main character until N shows up on Reshiram's back in the last second. This is all according to Getsis' plan, however. From there, he uses the DNA splices to forcefully fuse Reshiram and Kyurem, and now we are given one final chance to stop this Pokemon. I let Sean try and take it out, and he does a two-turn attack in one turn due to power herb nonsense, and he just barely lives it. I heal him and get a Psychic off while Kyurem does another hit. Sean's hits go down and down until 1. The perfect 1 HP survival. What a king, like what an absolute beast. I now gradually chip away at Kyurem until he goes down. N heals me just in time before Getsis launches into an uncontrolled rage, starting a battle with me. He starts off with his very tanky Cophagragus, getting Egg to very low HP. Then out comes a Genesect? What? So I send in Lumpy who deals with it well, not taking much of a hit from its Thunderbolt. But then a Gyarados? Okay, Nut deals with this, one shots it, gets some momentum back. Now was what I was fearing. High Dragon. I had no idea what to do, what set it was running, how to deal with it. I decided to sacrifice Michael because he hasn't really done much, he's too weak for this stage in the game. And I can't really see him doing much else in this battle to see what kind of set High Dragon's running. Michael just barely manages to tank a hit and gets a glare off, paralyzing it. Okay, this might be what we needed. I heal up Michael while he goes for a fire blast, and after this, and I know that he's running Life Orb, I swap into Gimlor, who in one dynamic punch takes out Hydreigon. My final two Pokemon are an Electros and a Machamp, both of which Robert deal with. Michael's probably going into retirement now because he's too weak for what we're going into, but damn, he went out with a bang. Getsis now formally disbands Team Plasma and then talks with us, explaining alongside Hugh that now the best place to go is Route 23, onwards from there towards Victory Road. Once we get there, N greets us and talks to us about what being a trainer really means. Also on Route 23, I catch a sort called Lewis, who cares, before replacing Michael with Homer. Now onto Victory Road proper. This area of the game has a lot of distinctly different areas with the same name, so as before, I'm counting these all as different areas. I get a Binet called Teddy, a Petlil I call Leaf, a Skarmory I call the Giant Claw, and Toad the Parasect. Then I have a scary encounter with a veteran trainer who had six Pokemon and a full rain team setup. It was going okay until the Garbus came out which was doing scary damage to Nut. I had to use three or so full restores before I could take out this fish. After this was a full team of six sand team which wasn't that bad and thank goodness I healed just after because right then there's a final battle with Hugh. His team is really good, almost take out Lumpy with his Boothal Arm, but it lives with 2 HP and finishes the job. Nice. Now it's time for the Pokemon League, so I get a good bit of training done, because these will be 5 very hard battles in a row, with a lot of types I don't do particularly well against. My one bonus here is that I can face them in any order I want, and that they all have the same level Pokemon. <laughs>
You've all seen it. I managed to beat the Elite Four without any casualties. And once I swap around some items and moves on my Pokemon, it's time for the final challenge against the champion, Iris. She starts with a Dragonite and I start with Egg. He manages to get it down to half HP while it sets up and just barely Egg lives with the Focus Sash I gave it in case of this and he manages to kill the Dragonite. Things are already intense. After this, a Feraligator comes out that Homer deals with, followed up with the Hydreigon. I was expecting this Pokemon to be on a team, so I teach Nut Bug Buzz. Nut dodges a Focus Blast and then tanks another one to finish the job on it. Next comes Archeop, so I keep Nut in, but he dies to an Earthquake. Rest in peace, Nut. You did well. Then Sean comes out and takes revenge on Archeops. It's defeat his ability being its downfall, while Sean could tank a second hit from it. Then out comes a superior which Egg dispatches with ease. Back against the wall, Iris sends out her ace in the hole, Haxorus. I keep Egg in who crits it with a dragon claw but it's got a focus sash. Egg can't take the outrage and falls. Another boy lost in this final battle. I send out my fastest Pokemon Homer to deal with the final blow against Haxorus. It lands and I win. I follow Iris up to the podium, register my team in the Hall of Fame and I'm now the new champion. We have a credit scene with a killer track I'll be using as the background for this bit of the video. In conclusion, just wow, what a game. I'll say what I think here in the immediate wake of doing this, but this was definitely the most enjoyable Pokemon game for me in years, and I can definitely say that this is my new favourite Pokemon game. Not only because of the challenge of the Nuzlocke run, not only because of the Vault White 2 challenge patch, but just the skeleton it was built upon was the most solid and consistent thing I could want to play. The plot was fantastic and everything it needed to be. Not cutscene hell like Gen 7 or boring like the other games, but it's gripping and filled with interest in characters like Hugh, Chorus, on top of an actual moving narrative. My one issue really is how little Chorus shows up and you only fight him twice, and that at points in the game I'd much rather fight against you than alongside him, but really th those are just two small issues that I'm nitpicking on. To top it off, I never expected going into this that I'd have some new favourite Pokemon in Arbok, Sourceburg, Salamence, Golurk, Behem of all Pokemon, and Triano's Vault White 2 was just a stellar experience. Fun gameplay changes, consistent challenge throughout the whole game without any spikes, reasonable level growth if you're not over level like I was at points, and really this is just the perfect RPG and it isn't long at all. The base game itself too is perfect, the environments look fantastic, the sprite work, the animations, it just pushes the DS to its limits. Comparing this to Diamond and Pearl, you just see how great Black and White 2 look in comparison. To top it off with an easy 10 out of 10 soundtrack, gigantic post game, and I can't even talk about things like how every trainer of note from every previous game is battleable, or how the season changes depending on what time of the year you play it in. Like, small details like that are just fantastic. I would recommend this challenge pack and Nuzlocke challenge to anyone who's fed up with Game Freak putting out more and more crap annually, especially after that disaster DLC expansion for Sword and Shield. This is what I would consider the absolute peak of its series at its very best. A perfect game that held up and overcome what I remember from 8 years ago. That's all for now though guys, take care.